There was a time before spending countless hours playing with my Commodore 64, a time before colorful graphics and amazing music, a time where my world was reduced only by 240 and 64 monochromatic pixels and very limited sounds, a time where BASIC was the only thing in my hand and machine language was far out of my league, a time when a 9 years old, back in 1984, had a laptop meant for journalists and businessmen. And that laptop was my very first computer. How did that happen? But before we get there, let's give it some love, bring it back to its original glory and see what it can do. Hello Chip Dippers. Now while Family Frantic takes a long overdue break, traveling the globe in search of rare retro tech and TV treasures to share with all of you, call me Indiana Joysticks, we are switching to Retro Recipes Co-op mode. Now I'll still be sharing regular updates on the Patreon as we travel around the world, but it is indeed those very same patrons that I'm passing the joystick to, and each week one of them will insert their disc into the Retro Recipes drive and share with you their own brand of retro magic inspired by Retro Recipes. I think it's a really great chance to spotlight some of those incredible channels out there, give them this platform and let them share what they can do with you. And this week it is the turn of Pietro and a very special project about breathing new life into my first 80s machine. So please enjoy this week's Retro Recipes 2 Up Takeover, and remember, be kind. No blowing in their cartridges to make them work harder. All right, 2 Up, you're up. Well, as you can see, the glass was damaged because when I was a kid, I tried to clean it with acetone, which actually corroded the surface and damaged it. Let's try to fix that with a polisher, which is usually used for the headlights of cars. I don't know if it's going to work, so be careful and don't try this at home if you're not sure. First, I had to use three levels of sandpaper strength. And then I used a wool polishing pad for as long as necessary until it was shiny. Well, after all that work, I'm pretty happy with the results. But before we turn it on, let's remove the keys and clean them up. For that, you can use a simple keycap remover like this. Here you have 80s dirt, very precious. First part done, now we need to remove the motherboard. Oh, look at that. Every time I see this, it's such a particular feeling. It's so beautiful. I remember the first time I opened it, I was really scared to break it, but I found it so beautiful and still, even now, when I do it, it's interesting, right? The excitement is still the same despite so many years and I've seen so many other PCBs and many other components, still, it's so beautiful. And speaking of PCBs, starting from $5, you can get your own PCBs shipped to your home thanks to PCB Way. You just design the PCBs at home, send the diagrams to them, and they will get delivered starting from just $5. They don't only do PCBs, but also CNC and 3D printing. Basically, it's your one single point to get all your projects done. They also have an open source section where you have tons of projects that you can just directly get the PCBs from there and build your own kits because we all know that PCB stands for Personal Computer Board, isn't it? Let's remove the motherboard to access the rest of the keyboard. Only three screws, a couple ribbon flat cables, and one more ribbon cable that connects the display. Now that the whole keyboard is out, we can remove also the keycaps of the function keys and then give all the keys and the case a very nice bath. This empty space here is because some time ago I had to remove the battery. It was damaging the motherboard by leaking the acid. It was too old. I got a temporary replacement with a battery of the same kind, but this is not ideal. The best solution is to use a button battery or a coin battery, also called, 
But in order to do that, it needs to be in a socket that includes a diode to prevent it from charge. That is a task for another day. For now, let's use the temporal one. This is looking a lot better. Let's put it back together. Let me share the story behind this computer. I got it from my cousin who worked at a bank and spent a fortune on it. He never really used it and tried to sell it, but no one wanted to buy. So he passed it on to me, his nine-year-old cousin obsessed with computers. It was designed for business and journalism, way out of my league at the time. Still, I believe that having it as my first computer pushed me toward programming over gaming, shaping the rest of my professional career. Well, we are ready now. Put the batteries and see if it turns on. And yes, it works. We are on January 1st of 1900. Every time I turn this computer on, I still have the same feeling of something important happening. I guess because when I was a kid, this wasn't really a toy for me. It was a computer, something important. And even now I have that feeling that when I turn it on, I still have the same sensation. A little bit of history about this computer. It was licensed from a Japanese company called Kyocera and they develop the Kyocera Kyotronic 85. I really like the name, it sounds pretty cool. Kyocera Kyotronic 85. <laughs> and other companies license the same computer, like the Tandy TRS-80 Model 100 and the NEC PC-8201. But the Olivetti N10 had something a little bit different than the other ones, and is the tilt screen. And also had a very nice to type keyboard, and the M10 offer a lot of connectivity as well. You were able to connect a barcode reader, a tape recorder to load or save your programs to cassette. Also, this model doesn't have it, but, but some models have here a port to connect directly to the phone line, so it has an integrated modem. Then it came with this parallel port, which was proprietary to connect to a printer. Then a serial port, RS-232, which was very common at the time, and you could connect that to a modem as well. Reset and power. The printer was amazing, it was actually this one here. A portable printer that you could use also batteries to power it up. It was interesting because it was actually a plotter. So here you have like small little pens that will draw the image. Unfortunately, my printer is broken. I'm planning to clean it up and fix it in the future. From a hardware perspective at the time, it was pretty powerful. You could expand the memory up to 32 kilobytes and you could actually keep the programs in the same computer for a certain period of time, which was very cool. And with all the connectivity possibilities that it had, that's why it was so attractive for journalists. They could write the article in the hotel connect to the phone and send into the newspaper. That was something special at the time. Let's take a look at the programs that it has. Oh no, we have a problem. The keys are not working. I have a feeling that it might be the connection between the keyboard and the motherboard. Let's take a look at it. I hope that just cleaning the contacts will do the job. Sometimes they get rusted and lose connectivity. I don't really want to replace these remote cables. Good, now it's working perfectly. Well, that was really scary. This computer had a basic interpreter, a text editor, a telecom program for telecommunications, basically connected to a modem, an address book, and a scheduler. Let's take a look at basic. Print, hello world, pretty standard. You could also create simple sounds. You put the frequency and then the time. The graphics were very limited, but you could also draw on the screen. There weren't many options about video games for this computer, it wasn't really that market, but I found some developed by Luca Gibo. The link is below, you can check it out, you can also play them in an emulator. It also had a text editor program. Name the file, RR from Retro Recipes. Hello, cheat tippers. And when you come back to the menu, you have the file there. We also have an address program to memorize our contact list. For example, find Perifractic, and it shows that he lives in one retro street. There is also a scheduler for our reminders. I think I promised something to Perifractic. Oh yes, here, send him a secret Commodore 64 poke command. Now let's take a look at the telecom program to connect to the internet. So here we technically should be able to connect to a modem. I don't have a landline, so I cannot connect it to a real modem. But I saw online there is a project about how to connect, which is called a null modem, which makes use of a similar device like this one. 
which is a microcontroller that can connect to the Wi-Fi and is able to receive serial communication. In the website I found it requires to do some soldering inside the motherboard, but I really don't want to touch it. So what we are going to do instead is connect it to the RS-232 port. For that we need to build a little PCB. This is a rudimentary null modem with two main parts. First, the ESP-8266 which is a microcontroller that connects to your 2.4 GHz Wi-Fi and the MAX-3232 chip which handles serial communication through the M10's RS-232 port. It also works with other computers that have a 25-pin or a 9-pin serial port. Keep in mind that this is a quick fix and an incorrect connection can damage your equipment, so only proceed if you are confident in what you're doing. Now that it is ready, let's copy the program from the GitHub repository. This program emulates a modem, and in order to install it, we need the Arduino IDE software. You will find details on installing the Arduino IDE and connecting to the ESP8266 on the Arduino website. All relevant links are in the video description. And now that the modem is ready, let's hook it up to the M10 and use the Telcom program. Before connecting to the modem, we need to set up parameters like transmission speed and error detection. Back in the day, NTEM users had to do all this manually, so next time we are frustrated dealing with Wi-Fi issues, let's remember those poor fellas. Now let's connect to some BBS. I can imagine probably I'm gonna have some trouble because the screen of this computer is too small. But at the same time, I would never imagine I would connect my first computer to the internet. In order to establish the serial connection, we use a command called term. So let's see now and... Yeah, it's working. Wow, that's so cool. Seriously. Basically, the M10 is talking directly through the serial port to the microcontroller, thinking that it is a modem because the modem is emulated by it. Wow, <laughs> that's so cool. We need to configure the modem to connect to the Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi name and the password. Let's connect first with the BBS provided on the GitHub page for the modem emulation program. Well, as expected, the ASCII art can't be displayed on this small screen. Okay, here it says, enter game, visit the game, create a new character. At least it's working. So now let's quit this and try another one. By the way, I got inspired to connect the M10 to some BBS because there is a video of Perifractic where he uses a real modem with a Commander X system and dials up some BBS. Check it out, it's really cool. Let's try this one called Dark Realms. I don't think we can use this one. Please provide you are real and not a bot or hang up and call back with an ANSI compatible terminal. Well, the poor M10 is not up to the task with this one. Let's try another one. This is called Heatwave and it was quite popular. Well, nice. This looks good on the M10 small display. Well, we don't have much time now, but I think this is promising. Depending on the BBS, I should be able to have some fun with it. For now, let's goodbye this BBS. Last but not least, this computer is affected by the Millennium bag, meaning that computers at that time, in order to save memory, they store the date using the last two digits, meaning that when it became 1999 and switched to 2000, it actually moved back to 1900. To see how the Millennium bag works, we need to set the date to the 31st of December of 1999 at 11.59. Basically, the moment it switched in midnight and should become 2000, but it will become 1900. Look at this. Boom, 1900. You see, we can't get to 2000. In order to do that, we need to replace the ROM, which is the read-only memory where the operating system and the programs are, with a new one that fixes that bug. Some people provided a bug fix for this ROM. You can download the file and then that file needs to be burnt, copy into a chip like this one here. And this is an EEPROM, an erasable programmable read-only memory, meaning that we can program this chip here with that file image that has the fix for the Millennium bag for this computer. To do that, we need a device like this to help us to program the EEPROM
and also another device similar to this one that has an ultraviolet lab here that allows to erase these eprons. We put them here in this cabinet and the ultraviolet light will delete them so we can program them again. After that, we're gonna give it a try. I hope everything works well. Ready? Let's turn it on. Yeah, here it is. It works. Yeah, 2000 minute and now we can only move 2000 after we can knock it back to the 1900s which is kind of sad because now the M10 cannot remember when it was born anyway the Millennium bag the operating system and all the original programs of the M10 are still stored here in the original ROM which I'm gonna keep very safe well here we are that was a lot of fun and an adventure the Olivetti M10 my very first computer I'm so happy and lucky that I have been able to keep it for so many years but now it will take the special place it deserves fully updated, restored, and internet capable. Thank you again, Perifractive, for the opportunity to share one more video here in Retro Recipes. Thanks so much for watching. Subscribe to my channel below and cheerio. One man can make a difference, Perry. Or one woman. Or dog. The Fractics, lone curators in a vintage world. The world of Retro Recipes.